Hi, I'm Heinbach. It's good to have you back. Welcome to the second Q&A of 2021, where I answer the questions that are sent in to me by the good people that support what I do on Patreon. If you want a question, just subscribe to any tier there and post a question in the sticky thread. Thank you very much. Now, before I get to the Q&A, some news. So my album Schwebungssumme is now sold out on vinyl. We made 500 copies, they're all gone. Thank you so much for buying this and yeah, posting about this album and helping it get out in the world. This means so much to me because this was a rather important record for me. I'm happy that so many of you thought similar. Thanks. Now, I didn't do many videos this year. It's kind of tough honestly, with uh, the whole <laughs> yeah, um, lockdown. So I guessed it in a few videos that I encourage you to check out. So there's one amazingly big video on Fundamental and iOS apps that was done by Jacob Haag and I'll link it. I think I have to put this finger up, but I always forget that. And then there is another one where I did a cameo on Alex Ball channel. We're talking about the fabulous Roland SH2 synthesizer and that's also up here. I also played a rather intimate set from my studio for the Magpie Pirates. Again, a link is here. And now let's get to the questions. Christopher Siever, you're pretty prolific with your creative output. How do you stay motivated to produce and what is your routine that helps your creative output so consistent with such a high level of quality? It's, oh my God. I just realized in the past few weeks how much I rely on everything being in place because as you can see, I had some acoustics installed and this room now sounds so much better thanks to Kiss Your Ears, but I had to dismantle the studio and not having that made me feel like half a person. It was crazy. It was, I couldn't, setting it all up and all up and all up again, I haven't recorded much music in that time. I think only one track, but I prepared stuff. <laughs> it's gonna be happening, but not fin I finished only one track, which is like a rather huge dry spell for me to do only one track in a week. So <laughs> it's super important to have everything in place and always be ready to just work, to have at least some way to yeah, immediately use the energy and the little time that is to create. And yeah, that's utterly, utterly important. Because else, yeah, if I feel I've got too much to do just to get my studio running and working, it's... I'd rather sit on the couch and play Breath of the Wild with my kids. So, yeah, everything in place, super important. But I also made a video on creativity and I should probably watch that to remind myself because there's a lot of stuff, a lot of techniques that I also do that have helped um, next to simply having everything always ready and in place. So do check that out. Right finger, I hope. And there's one other thing <laughs> in regards to quality. You don't get to see a lot of the stuff that's, yeah, that's not uh, quality. There's a lot of stuff that I, ah, no, 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 this just goes in a folder, maybe for later reference or for nothing at all. If I realize, or I even kill it in the beginning, if I realize something, no, this is not worth it, I just, pff, and make another piece. i rather produce more than work myself to death over an idea that probably won't ever bloom. So, Devlin, what is the easiest way to create Instagram vids? I have an iPhone, but I'm struggling to record stereo audio into it while using the camera video app. The only solution seems to be mono. I started out with Instagram and that was pretty successful. And I think one of the little unfair advantages I had was that I used an Android phone and that is stereo. So uploads from there are stereo. Uh, that was back in the day and I haven't even checked now if the uploads that I do now from my iPhone are mono or stereo <laughs> because yeah, I never and, and almost never put headphones on with my phone. I don't think it's that important anymore to be stereo on that thing. The best thing is it just make it sound as good as possible and look as good as possible. 
But what I've always done is not use the internal camera. I don't use the internal camera on the phones that I use for posting to the Instagram feeds or the Instagram, uh, what's the other thing, reels, the copy of TikTok. I film with a nice, oh, something like this. Is it in frame? Ah, okay. Uh, cut that out. <laughs> no, something like this GH5 or the black magic camera I'm filming everything. So now this is, and then I edit that in a video software and make the audio levels good and nice. Clean audio is absolutely important, line audio. And uh, then I upload that. So it's a very curated piece already with color grading and all that stuff. And I've been doing this consistently because yeah, I noticed the difference in quality. Now we're talking about videos here for posts like it's perfect like the cameras are perfect they just work fine add a little bit of filtering a little bit of treatment and then it will just pop and find a consistent visual style so people will know oh i think i know who took this picture so that's something that's also to be mindful about but in regards to videos yeah stories again use the what's it called internal camera that's also fine but for anything else i think you are best set to up your production game it's not easy but it's worth it because i'm super tired of phone videos like with sound except in stories where it's quick and dirty but for the feed and reels it has to be of a good quality and i mean sometimes when i look for rare gear rare synthesizers and all i see are like phone demos on youtube and stuff i'm like okay i'm gonna do a nicer one and I'm gonna make this so people will actually get the sound and the feeling. So the solution would be record with a decent camera or an audio interface at least or yeah use a tripod and an audio interface with the camera on your iPhone and of course lighting. <laughs> <laughs> Never forget about the lighting. If you don't have uh, yeah, professional lights like I do have here, up here, semi-professional, <laughs> cheapy, but uh, yeah, uh, then you will need daylight. So I use daylight as much as possible thanks to Jeremy, Red Means Recording. He made a great video on how he films everything, his OP1 videos back in the day. And it was all about daylight and how how that can be complicated again because for him i think he mentioned he was living in seattle which means there wasn't much daylight every day so yeah small windows that you have to actually film so if you want to be kind of successful on instagram with that it is not easy it is work but yeah that's how i do it so i hope this helps Trey Milner, I just bought an Ua Report Monitor 6000 to make some Heimbach inspired loops and soundscapes with a new acoustic piano. Now that I'm finally able to play quarter speed. Nice. I promise I won't rip you off. <laughs> you can. <laughs> okay. What kind of tape do you suggest? One for high quality, one for lower fidelity budget tape. And is still sold on 5 inch reels, or do I have to wind my own using larger reels? Yes, you probably have to wind your own from larger reels. That's what I do. But I also bought a bunch of stock tape like uh, 468, SM468, which is not the one you should be getting. You should probably be getting LPR35, but it really depends on what the machine was biased for. So you can bias these machines for many things. Just be aware that the thicker studio tape like 911, which is pretty common in recording studios, might be too thick for the machine. So the signal to noise ratio won't be as great. But if you're doing loops, I think basically most tape is fine if it's for experimental purposes. And you can buy used, you can buy secondhand. And yeah, having a big machine, if you want to have new tape to re-spool stuff is really handy. Again, that can be any machine that takes these uh, cakes and because buying cakes is cheaper than buying them with the reels. So yeah, probably LPR 35 would be my choice for the Ur. And then you have to bias it for that machine. And there are probably tutorials out there for that. I haven't even checked how it is for the Ur 6000 because that's a later model. 
but you might be able to find someone who can do that for you, hopefully. You are in Alaska, wow. That must be beautiful. Paul Loveridge, I suspect most of us here go through the agony and self-doubt concerning our own thoughts and about whether the track is finished or not. And does the track need just one more little flourish to make the music shine or not? Mm -hmm, I know that. How do you silence the voices in your head that are demanding a full symphony orchestra, four basses and a Krumhorn Shepard tone solo just to nicely finish off the track? Process. I adapted my process to not allow for that. I started, as most of us did probably, in the digital audio workstation with unlimited tracks. That was, that's what happened, unlimited tracks. And then you build the track from all these different pieces and there's always room for one more and it's it takes forever. So now that I've changed everything to an analog workflow with where I'm committing everything to be done and through the tape machine, everything gets that finished sound already. It's kind of feels the track are done with less things. And sometimes I add these little flourishes like in transitions because there they really help. And they're super hard to pull off an analog because I only have two hands and I love using primitive sequences like the SQ1. So I don't have many options in regards to that. So one or two little flourishes might be added in post basically. But yeah, the whole workflow is analog and I think about so I always so there isn't there's never there's it looks like I have a lot of stuff here but still compared to what you could get in a audio workstation it's not because at most I have like let me look at this I have maybe like nine tracks ten tracks at the most going and everything else is kind of combined into different things so that really helps in getting stuff finished because the things that I make in that state while I'm recording a live performance is also akin to a flow state where I do these expert decisions, but from the gut. So it's like this, yeah, this oceanic feeling that I always try to go for, unless the I need to design this track feeling that I really suffered for a long time for and I overproduced my music badly. That was a learning experience over the years. Dr. Popular, what is an Ipster? I see you mention it, but I missed the original reference. Ah, yes, that's something I call everyone on my Patreon. I'm sorry if it sounds kind of dumb, but I I think it's funny because all the tiers are basically tape speeds. And IPS means ins per, inches per second. So instead of, yeah, I call everyone Ipsters because, yeah, they're tape speeds. <laughs> Let me know how you feel about this. I, For me, it's a term of endearment, but yeah, I can stop doing that if it's, I don't know, somehow not appropriate or stupid. <laughs> Dmark, given the difficult circumstances, have you considered creating more music with a direct political or sociopolitical message? Yes and no. It's a complicated question because I make instrumental music. So message is something that can be very blurry in that circumstances. And instrumental music, yeah, it doesn't carry a precise message per se. It creates an atmosphere and creates a feeling. And with Schwebungsummer, I think I already started this political process in the atmosphere and yeah, in the song titles. I mean, whoo, out of darker days, it will stay dark. That's the that's the end of the album. And that was kind of like the 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 mood I was going for. And it's gonna be even darker with the album that follows this up. And the single should come out that week for that. And uh, yeah, that's a continuation of this darker perspective on life right now and a crisis that keeps only spiraling and developing more and more. I've done a lot of political work in my theater work because that's very political and the topics that I discussed are very political. So there were more direct messages in there. And, uh, but for, the instrumental music that I do, it's it's now in the atmosphere. It's in how I treat 
the world and the sounds and how I guide the story through the track titles. And you'll see that in the next album. That said, if a lyricist came along whose political message I can vibe with, I would totally be up for a collaboration. And there have been contacts in that area, but nothing I can talk about yet. Jack Fetterman. United States, I received a coma field kit. One day I had was to purchase a set of wireless microphones to place around my house and yard to feed into the kit. That's a super nice idea. Do you have a recommendation for a type of microphone set that would work for this application? I'm seeing mostly wireless karaoke mics. Do you think they would work? Who? They would be cheap at least. And I wonder, like, I've got, honestly, I don't have much idea about that. I used to work with wireless a lot in the theater, but that's like the really expensive DPA stuff. So uh, there, I know my way around just a bit, but I don't handle these things. This is something that the sound stuff always does. So that's something, a question I can probably give back to uh, you, the viewers. If you've got recommendations for yeah, a wireless mic that could be work workable in this application, please post it in the comments. Jason Steanci. I hope I got that right. Hi, Heinbach. I've been making music for a couple of years, but I've been struggling to build an audience. I was wondering if you had any tips. I think that's a video for itself. And uh, yeah, it's... It's difficult and you have to be very consistent and you have to keep at it and you have to engage in communities. You have to engage with the local communities. So start local, build up your network there, put on shows, work with people, like help out, do stuff, be a part of the community. And then you have to expand that to international communities through like forums and uh, Instagram, Twitter, all these social media and videos. Video helps tremendously in getting your music heard more because this this whole like music being diverted or music being devoid of a image is something that's so 20th century <laughs> when uh, yeah you could press records just on a yeah you could pre press records basically and then the only image that you had was the rotating thing and a cover and sometimes not even that so that's a 20th century thing and before all that time music had always a visual aspect to it and now with the available bandwidth and everybody can broadcast, we can give this visual thing back. And that's something that's absolutely fascinating. And everybody can find their own visual voice, which might not be easy, but there's so many tools luckily to help you get a more, yeah, a more appealing visual for what you're doing. Or you can collaborate with someone to add that visual element for you. So basically what it boils down is engage in communities online and in real life and then create a visual identity for yourself and your music and that and then keep at it keep grinding <laughs> keep posting posting keep uh putting out music keep talking with people about it and uh yeah takes time and takes dedication that should find you at least a small audience anything above that that's totally up to chance luck right time right place right thing so you can't really control that unless you're constantly monitoring the zeitgeist and try to write or compose for that yeah which is a whole thing in itself stick larsen aka and then so clear Hello Heimbach and thanks for the album Schwebungsummer. You're currently releasing music regularly. Do you have a long-term plan for your releases or you're just releasing as you feel the music is ready for release? These are long-term plans. I think Schwebungsummer was in the make for I probably a year and it was supposed to come out much earlier, but you know how it is with the situation. So it came out, I think, like four months later than it was supposed to come out and uh, i've got more albums this year and those have, have been planned for over one and a half years or a year also so with these especially with physical releases the cycles are long and long and i'm currently working on uh oh my how many albums like i think i have two more done and uh one of those is already scheduled for release. And I also have two in my head <laughs> that I'm just writing now. So 
I basically plan 2022 already. And then there's the nice thing that I can send music to my patrons. So I feel like, oh, this is a little, some, some people already get like this little fan club singles already. And then there is um, Bandcamp, and I love to put stuff that's just like, okay, this needs to be out now. Like my album with this request T50. I just put that out there and immediately. And it's like, ah, very nice. Very, makes me very happy to have done this like within two or three days and then put it out there and there it is. Or releases that are very cumbersome to put to any streaming service like the Structure Loops 124, put it out there. So yeah, that's like my quick fix of make something put it out and get direct feedback. So it's never as effective like reach wise as putting out a proper album, but it just doesn't have to be. Sometimes it's just nice to, yeah, to keep up the flow of what you're doing and not submit to the release cycles, which can be a bit deadening to the creative process at some times because of delays and delays and delays, but you get used to that also. Yeah, I hope this, uh, Helps. Jacob Stevens. My schnauzer is entering the realm of old age and losing his hearing. This makes his already prolific barking extra intense and loud. I've decided I should make use of this and recorded him barking with my Zoom H5. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions of how I could make music with this? How would I would you go about making this into some sort of aggressive pad? That's beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful. Dog pad. Uh, I would... Yeah. Oh my. So many ideas. I would... Uh, use yeah so you have it recorded already so some kind of looper would be cool I can recommend Gauss and uh, then just layer as many of these as you can and then run it through effects on the iPad it would be the EOS uh, from Audio Damage to make it like wide and um, on Gauss you then half speed, quarter speed you slow it down and you make this basically sound on sound layer of all these and that could be a very nice thing to use then as a basis to record that record it onto another sampler and play that polyphonically so that would work or I would just run it through a microcosm and then give it the qu dual quadraverb treatment so added distortion, make it aggressive. Uh, there's so many possibilities, but just record as many of these as you can, layer them, layer them, layer them, pitch them down. So you have a really barking orchestra. Use a granular tool, uh, maybe also to just have all these little or you could upload it into like, just take, find somehow a single like bark cycle in there and then put that into a wavetable synthesizer and see where that takes you. So you ah. I love the idea. And please tag me when you make it reality. I would love to hear that. <laughs> kind of heartwarming. Plush Elder God. Einbach, in Entropy First, the Impulse Generator, the basic beat consists of a high-pitched, buzzy, hollow sound, followed by the low-pitched kick. Ah. That alarm sound. Okay, that's that's easy to answer, because that's a lock-in amplifier. A lock-in amplifier is a high gain amplifier with a band pass filter that's super sharp and a tracking LFO. So it's a combination of these things and lots of overdriving it that gets these down, down, down sounds. So if you were to replicate this, you need a high gain amplifier, a ping, something that pings it. Um, so you need a trigger, that's the first thing. Then you need a high gain amplifier, you need a uh, super tight bandpass filter, you need a uh, way to tune that bandpass filter and modulate it at the same time with an oscillator, and then you need an output gain to give you another way of overdriving the signal. So that's the basic lock and amplifier patch. And if you want to try that, this is how you could set this up. Can Shash talk? Bullion care question. I recently picked up a BNK 2215 precision sound level meter and octave analyzer for $15. That's nice. And he needs, the question is about the connector. Okay, you can use the Voodoo Labs barrel to jack adapters. I use those also to connect my old electroharmonics kit to a regular power 
supply and these work fine that's a tip div, uh, div kit found so voodoo labs barrel to jack and yeah those are cheap and they work really well to connect brilliant care sound level meters filters to other things daniel cathrell hey heinbach recently picked up a duo 6a wondering if you had any thoughts you could share on your approach to the juno where you use it in your music or any go-to patches <laughs> everything it's it's simply a synthesizer that works for me in so many roles it can be a lead when sequenced and i use the tr606 to sequence the arpeggiator on it because it has a clock in and that's just gorgeous for me and i've been using it in that lead role for a lot of times then i use it as the secret pad Sometimes there are tracks that just need a little bit of glue and then the Juno comes in really low in the background and everything is just, okay, that works now suddenly. That's a magical effect. And it's such a distinctive sound, but it can be adapted in so many ways and it's never really bad. But one thing that I've recently gotten to is to avoid a bit of that classic Juno sound is to split it into three band pass filters and then I turn it into all these little parts and all these little parts sound then like sound science and it becomes a very unsynthesizer-like. And yeah, that's right now one of my favorite Juno patches. Take it apart into all these little frequencies because it's so rich in harmonics. And when I spread around these, it's creates kind of a magical atmosphere that's very distinct. It's not as Juno-esque as one would always think. So I hope this gives you ideas, but uh, yeah, it's really such a useful synthesizer. I only have the Juno 60, so I don't really know how the yeah 06 sounds compared to that, but from what I heard, the boutiques are all pretty decent, right? So. Jan Levot. Hi, Heinbach. Thanks for all. You are the one who makes me restart composing. Amazing. That's super good to hear. I've seen a polygogo in your setup. What are your thoughts on it? Do you plan a tutorial for it and or using the track? If you're not already done, all the best. Ah, yeah, that's the ERM Erfindungsbüro polygogo. And I actually have it dead there in the other side. I have the camera set up and I'm going to do a Eurorack video. And this should be coming out after this video and there I talk about the polygogo and I really want to do like a dedicated video to it because I find it fascinating and I talk with the developer and just the whole origin story of this whole module is beautiful because it comes from conspiracy theories on reddit that was where the initial idea came so I'm really looking forward to exploring it more because the sounds that I've been getting from this are very very exciting and I've used it in sound design already for a game soundtrack I'm working on, which or game sound design, not soundtrack. So which you'll probably get to hear in two or three years. <laughs> but it is an amazingly beautiful tool and I can't wait to explore it more. And it's absolutely something I can recommend if you're looking for something more out there in regards to Eurorack oscillators. Derielle Le Soleil. Hi Heinbach, I would like to ask about copywriting. My question is how do you manage your copywriting with loop? Is this on Creative Commons or do I register them to GEMA? Thanks for your answer. I think this is a Patreon specific question because I put out these sound packs and they contain a lot of loops and they're absolutely free to use. They are not musical pieces, so I'm not registered them with GEMA. And if you use these as a Patreon in your music, absolutely fine. There's one caveat though. There is this thing called YouTube music and they specifically say, don't use music made up from samples, <laughs> especially if they were sampled from some YouTube videos and stuff. So if you upload your thing, you have to uncheck that or whitelist my channel because else I would get a copy strike and that wouldn't be nice. So yeah. That's the only caveat that I have. Whitelisting my channel through your di digital distribution or yeah, don't upload it to YouTube Music because yeah, by the terms of how, what's it called? How they are uh, set up, 
that's not even allowed. If you were to sample my music, my tracks, you have to probably, you have to notify me, <laughs> then we can discuss. And I usually do like a 50-50 deal on the writing credits. So GEMA, and, uh, so I get uh, basically paid through GEMA, which is the royalty collection agency that I've been using since decades now. All right, wow, I think that was all the questions. This is a lovely Sunday morning talk for me. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody for asking. And if you want to get a question in, again, just subscribe to any tier on my Patreon and ask one question per month in the sticky thread. And I'll happy to answer it on video. And let me say thanks to all the patrons for making this possible. Roll credits.